which that word used in the passages. And we can only do this if we look at the whole text or the whole, uh, not just the whole chapter, but also the whole book. And it's nice because at that moment, after after the Easter uh, month and after the Easter uh, celebration, we have now uh, started to focus on Jesus. When a when, when things go wrong in our lives, and when we become confused, or when things in our ministry goes uh, goes south. We are, sometimes we think about the purpose or even the cause of those problems. We, we think about um, administrative problems or leadership problems. And we can think about um, mismanagement of all sorts. But it all boils down to whether a church highlights Jesus or becomes Christ-centered. We can argue all day long or even weeks without end, all weeks on end without really figuring a definite solution. But whenever we get confused, all we need to do is come to Christ and not focus on anything else, not focus on the methods, not focus on the persons, but focus on Jesus himself. And there was one person uh, in the Philippines that I was mentoring, and it came a time that he was now the, the leader. He was... Uh, on a national level because in the Philippines we um, one of my ministries there is to train young leaders and in our mentoring group this young leader became a leader himself and he started preaching and there was one time that uh, he came to me and said uh, Pastor Melvin uh, later on he became my you know my uh, God is there a is there a, a, a definite translation for ina na God's son? God, God, God's son. And uh, he and his wife were started to become our mentees. And when he started preaching now, because right now he's overseeing a ministry that I left. And as he was saying, as he was asking, how do I preach when I don't, really don't know the congregation or... I really don't have to drive this time because I'm, I'm filled with a lot of uh, my joy is robbed. Especially the congregation that I'm preaching to is not really a congregation that I like. And how do I go about the preaching? How do I handle the congregation? How do I know what they want to hear? You know what I, I told the, our, our, this mentee of mine, I told him, it's about time, of, you know, when we preach, we always at need to understand that at the end of the day, Jesus must be lifted up, regardless of the sermon, regardless of the ministry, and uh, without, um, you know, when, when things go really difficult, we go to the basics, we go to Jesus Christ. So sometimes all of the problems happen because we do not, we, we are not Christ-centered, and in, in the ministry, this will truly solve a lot of problems if we just place Christ at the center. Not anything else, not anyone else, not a, an ideology or even a methodology. Just Jesus. And we will see, we will know that if we pattern our ministry based on His ministry and His character, I know that things will be clearer because Jesus is the light. He will be the light unto our feet and a lamp, uh, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So tonight, uh, one of the things um, to be Christ-centered, I mean, one of the ways, sorry, to, to be Christ-centered is to realize the purpose of God. Sometimes we ask the question, Will God will a Christian to suffer? Pastor, uh, depressing naman yan. You know, when, when you deal with that, why do, you, why do we always deal with these difficult questions? Some people don't even want to ask that question. Some people would say, great faith is not asking the why, or not even asking the what. 
uh, or, or not asking the why, but ask, just asking the what. What, and then I'll do it. Blind faith. But I do not think that God wants us to have blind faith. In fact, He opens the eyes of the blind. He wants us to understand. But there are moments that we truly ask. We can ask the question, does God will Christians to suffer? I mean, what, uh, somehow we, we think no. But what about the missionaries who get killed in different countries? What about the Christians who get raped? Remember, in, in the Philippines, there was a, an Australian missionary who had a prison ministry who got raped. So these are the tough questions that we should ask the Lord. Because if we ask these questions, we know that there will always be a good result when we are enlightened. So let's try to figure this out using the scripture of the Lord. Remember, we're really going to the nitty-gritty of the things that really and truly matter in our faith. Does God will a Christian to suffer? Let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter 3, 15 to 17. Let's try to see just a portion of this passage that may help us find the answers. So I tell you this message is not for the optimists. <laughs> but I, I am an optimist, uh, you know, most of the time. But I tell you, when, when we are faced with this passage, we will understand why. Why, this, why God allows this to happen. 1 Peter 3, 15 to 17. So this is what it says in 1 Peter 3, 15 to 17. And I'm going to be reading from the New Literal Translation. And it says... Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear that if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. And then uh, maybe we can go to 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but He died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but He was raised to life in spirit. Wow. Let's try to uh, let that sink in to our uh, in, in our minds and our hearts right now. It, mentions, it says here that if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But what, was, what is the context there? Um, do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep a, yeah, your conscience clear. That if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good. It is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants. That statement there, regardless of the translation, it says, if this is what God wants. Look at the NASB, ESV, NIV. It says, if that is what God wants. There are moments in our lives that God wants wills us to suffer. So, it sounds really harsh, right? Especially when we think that um, God is the, the perfect parent who would not want to see any of His children suffer. Just like a good parent, would you want to see your child be in pain or suffer? But, uh, well, the answer is definitely no. I don't want to see any of my children get hurt or be in a difficult position. But there are moments that God would allow suffering to happen because He definitely has a good purpose for it. But if we ask that question, we know that the purpose of the Lord here in this particular passage is a definite purpose. Let's try to see what that purpose is. 
He says, if that is what Christ wants, then to suffer for doing wrong. If we are to suffer for doing right, God would want us to do that instead of us suffering, uh, doing wrong. Living a life that is wonderful or happy while doing wrong. So God would rather have us suffer. I, I, imagine this in, in the very simplistic um, example. If we see any of our children doing something that is um, something that is pleasurable, but it's wrong, would you want to tell your child or the people that you love stop doing that, even if they enjoy it? See, that is a very simple explanation. But in the larger scheme, God would definitely want us to live a righteous life instead of living a life of evil or a life of sin. So He would will us to suffer. He would will us to have that point of pruning or disciplining. So let's, oh, when we ask the question, Lord, why am I suffering right now? Well, probably one of the reasons why God is allowing you to suffer is because He's trying to steer you away from disastrous, uh, from, from a disastrous situation. He is steering someone away from an evil situation. Remember, the pleasurable moments is with, you know, it, it is in or with the, of the multitude of people. That's when fun really starts, when everyone is, hey, hello, we're having fun. We're in this, uh, we're, we're in this place where we have fun. And when that happens, and when, when someone, well, we, as Christians, we need to wonder if we're not suffering or we're not going, or something is not amiss or we're not causing any friction, then we have to wonder, am I still doing the things that are right? Because there are moments that God will really allow suffering so that He can put us into the right place. So again, let's try to see the other reasons. So the first reason that we can see here, why does God allow, uh, allow His children to suffer? We're not just asking the question, why does God allow suffering? You know, that's... That the question, the answer there to the question, why does God allow suffering, is that He wants to bring people closer to Him. He wants them to realize uh, their need for the Lord. But right now, why does God allow Christians to suffer? Well, because first, the first reason, as what I have mentioned a while ago, is because God wants us, uh, it wants us to be in the right place instead of doing the things that are wrong. Second, Reason. Let's try to analyze it again. Let's try to um, look at 16b. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live. They will be ashamed. One of the reasons why God allows suffering for a Christian is so that those who speak against them will be ashamed or will be put to shame. How so, Pastor Melvin? I don't get it. How does this, what is the connection between them being put to shame and the suffering of a Christian? Can't be, that can't it be the other way around? Like a non-Christian or someone who slanders a Christian would see that the Christian is successful or doing great in his life. Well, not necessarily because if someone slanders a Christian. Remember the context here, if we would read chapters 3 to 4, the context here is someone who lives his life as a soundboard or even a, a, uh, a preacher of the word. Now if a Christian gets persecuted because of his faith, 
A non-believer will be put to shame if that Christian is able to remain true to his faith, to still do the right works. Remember, um, uh, I, I think I gave this uh, story in one of our cell groups, in the prime timer cell group. There was a group of missionaries who went to a remote tribe in Africa, and then they were killed in that tribe. And then their family members, their children, I mean their children, came to that same tribe to continue reaching out to them. And they succeeded. The generation of two missionaries who followed after the footsteps of their, their parents succeeded in reaching out to this tribe. And then the same people who killed their parents became Christians and they themselves became ministers of the word. And they were put to shame. They were saying in their testimonies how, um, how shameful or how we are so uh, filled with guilt because of what we have done in the past. Similar to our situation, if someone, if there are some people who persecute us because of our Christian principles or because of our Christian stance or even the message that we give, we can put people to shame by the lives that we live, the lives of integrity and the lives of love, a, a life of love. See, this is how we can put people to shame. It's not by retaliation. It's not by showing who's stronger, but it is truly to show the non-believers that those who live in Christ have peace, that even though they are persecuted or even killed for their faith, they are living not for the worldly things, but the things that are at the real. So, this is one of the things that we can consider. Also in 1 Peter 4, 19. I know a while ago we studied 1 Peter 3. And let's jump to 1 Peter 4, 19. It says here, So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to the God who created you, for He will never fail you. Aha! So another, um, another proof that God allows suffering, but if we are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. Because sometimes we suffer when we do not align ourselves with the movement of the world. When we go against the flow. Doesn't that hurt? Doesn't that cause suffering? When a lot of people think that we're weird, like Noah, remember? And last Sunday we touched up, uh, we touched on Noah a little bit. I mean, we, we figured out that the reason why what well, what what made him righteous wasn't primarily his obedience, but it was his faith that led to his obedience. He believed in God, even though he did not know what rain was. Even though he didn't know what an ark was, or he didn't know how to fit 18,000 species of animals inside of a boat, he doesn't even have a concept of a flood. But he believed. He believed in God. Then, out of his faith, came obedience. Some people think that it's the other way around. You know, when we do good first, but how can you do good when you're, when you're not really convinced? This places emphasis on faith. That even though a person is suffering, even though we don't understand why we must go through these things as long as we are doing what is right, it pleases God. If it says in His Word that we stand on this position, we stand on this, um, on, on this uh, particular persuasion, if it is truly from the Bible, and if the Holy Spirit is moving us to do something, then we should not worry about what other people would think, because it would please God. So remember, there are so many different 
um, situations. We may fit this in our own particular situation. We're not talking about a particular, uh, just any situation, but in, in our situation as Christians, when we suffer, we know that if we remain true or righteous, if we continue to have faith in God and obey His commands, we will please Him. So even though we receive jeers or stares or even rejection, as long as we do what is right and trust our lives to God, He will never leave us nor fail us. So this is a very different message from the motivational speakers. That if you believe in God, don't worry, you'll get a lot of money or you'll be rich. But the reality is, no, we will have to endure suffering one way or another. And it's all, it also says in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, it says here, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. Um, on Facebook, I, my, if you know, if you're familiar with um, Scott Wesley Brown, I was able to meet him in the Philippines. We, we performed with him in a concert. And right now, he's my friend on Facebook. And then he posted on his status, he said there, Someone just called me a Christian radical or a Christian extremist. And then the next statement is, I must be doing something right. I said, wow, is that sarcasm or is that true? But you know, the Bible, if, if we look at the Bible, that's, that's true. If we're shaking the ground, if we're um, offending some people, not necessarily because of our demeanor or our char character, but because of our message. If people don't even want to listen to our message because we're preaching or we're speaking things, uh, precepts that are found in the Bible, then we know that we are doing something right. Don't be surprised. That's what uh, Peter is saying here. That's what the author is saying in Hebrews. If you're believing, if you're speaking the truth, don't be surprised if people hate you for it. Or slander, that's, that's what 1 Peter 3 says. If they call, call you all sorts of names, you false person, you. You, um, you, uh, you're not really fit for that, or you're not this, you're not that. You Christian radical, you are, uh, you, you, you really don't have a clue about the world. Don't be surprised. That's why we're also told, that's why, you know, I, I also read it in uh, one of the journals in the Southern Baptist Church uh, journals. I don't know exactly where I read it, but uh, it, it all comes back to me when, when they say that the world doesn't owe us anything because uh, when we feel that, that we're entitled to good, um, good treatment from other people. Remember when, when secular people act differently or strange or, or even uh, very aggressive towards Christians? We react and we say, why are you persecuting us? Well, Peter says, don't even be surprised. You don't even... Uh, you're not entitled to good treatment because you were meant to truly do what is right. So don't be surprised. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in His suffering. It makes us partners with Christ if we're suffering, if we're if we have to endure something for our faith so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing His glory when it is revealed to all the world. And that is how we can put other people to shame as well. When they start to see that, oh, wow, in the last days, yeah, He was right. That's why I keep telling people when people start to argue about ideologies, 
or principles, or even, you know, in a church. Uh, when people start arguing about carpets or colors or, you know, anything that's silly, I tell them these are, these are non-essentials. And if you have particular persuasions, you know, eventually what we need to do is to just fix our eyes on Jesus and keep moving forward. We should not spend too much time on debates. We should not spend too much time on arguments. We should not spend too much time on determining who is right or who is wrong. Because like in Hebrews, the message in Hebrews, all of us commit sins, all of us need grace, all of us are in the dark, except, you know, if we just cling to Jesus, if we place ourselves in His care, then and only then can we be able to see what is true. That's why in our lives, we cannot survive if we are not Christ-centered. And to be Christ-centered is realizing that we truly are not entitled to any good treatment or even we are not entitled to what, whatever, um, you know, whatever uh, good treatment because of our good works. But why must we study this? Why must we hear this? Why must we be reminded of this? It is to calm our spirits when suffering happens. It is to make us think that, ah, in the end, as what is mentioned in chapter 4, the Lord will never fail us. And our satisfaction does not come from whatever the world gives us. In 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7, it says here, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. That's why I'm so sad when I hear people say, I don't want to go to church anymore. Why? Because I stumble at the suffering that we experience. I get disappointed at God because I don't experience a physical upliftment or even material wealth just like the other people and, and I, I'm also sad when people say I don't want to commit to church why because the church is so it's it's so entangled in a lot of hardships which makes me believe that when we have this thinking our spiritual maturity is of babies and infants. We should not be surprised if we experience difficulties. And this should not cause us to back away or not commit to the Lord or not give ourselves to the mission or the service. It sounds very harsh, but this is the main principle, the precept that God is saying. We must endure trials for a little while. Because these trials will show that our faith is genuine. Not backing down, but pressing forward. Continuing to serve Him regardless of the situation. Regardless of the situation. And John 16, 33 says, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. This is now the encouragement for us. We should take heart because I have overcome the world. That's our main encouragement this evening. Even though we face struggles, even though we're weak, even though we would get sick, even though some of us may, you know, you may... You may even see that, uh, I may even say to you next week, most probably, uh, not most probably, you know, there's a probability that I would come to you one day and would say, I'm sick, or I have a heart problem, I have a heart condition. That doesn't necessarily mean that God doesn't like me, or God doesn't love me, or He's punishing me. That only means 
that God allows that to happen in my life so that I can see His will, I can be reminded of His purpose, I can put people to shame because of the faith that He has instilled in me, and that is also to show that Christ has already overcome the world. So if you're sick, or if you're going through something right now, if you're going through a difficult situation, God loves you. God still loves you. God has not forgotten about you. And that the, the reason why He allows that to happen in your life, whether you are lonely or sick or afflicted with um, heartache, God is there. God, uh, God wills that to happen for a good purpose. And now we have seen His purpose that He truly, truly wants His glory to be revealed in our lives. He has overcome the world. And thank God it's not up to us to prove anything to the world. Thank God it's okay to be not okay. It's okay to be weak because in our weakness, God can be made strong. Let us pray. Our dear loving Heavenly Father, tonight, O oh Lord, we have tackled the difficult topic of why you will, uh, why sometimes, O oh Lord, you will us to, uh, you, it is your will for us to suffer. Lord, thank you because you show us your purpose. You show us, Lord God, that it is not because you don't love us anymore. It is not because you're, you are a sadist. But thank you, Lord, because you want us to suffer for doing what is good and you would rather have us do good than evil. Thank you, Lord, for sparing, for, for showing us, Lord God, that you want to spare us from the worldliness, the, 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 the evil, Lord, that is in our world. And you want to show us, Lord, your love by just um, giving us that joy and reminding us that um, you have overcome the world. It's not up to our own strength or understanding. So right now, Lord God, we pray that we would truly place our trust in you. And at this moment, Lord God, that even though we suffer, may we not back down from the challenge that is ahead of us. May we not retreat and be uh, and and be cowards, O oh Lord, but help us to be strong and courageous to just press on to move forward and be encouraged, Lord, by Your Word that You are with us. And when You are with us, Lord God, we are we will be able to overcome the difficult situations and circumstances of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your love. This is our prayer. The most precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So right now, brothers and sisters, um, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be calling some people to lead us uh, to prayer. So we have some uh, segments here. Church concerns. We have social concerns. We have um, special prayer concerns and a prayer for healing. So for our prayer uh, uh, church concerns, we do have, um, but we want to add here our activities for this month and also for July and uh, our church anniversary. So that's, uh, we have seven items for our church concerns. And we're going to be asking Quia uh, Irwin to pray for items one to three. And then four to seven, we're going to ask Apin Neng to pray for that. And then for our social concerns, nine, ten, and eleven, we're going to ask Quia Edwin to pray. And then 
12, 13, 14, we're going to ask Kuya Angel to pray. And then 15, 16, 17, we're going to ask Kuya Ernie to pray. 18, 19, and 20, we're going to ask Tita Flor to pray for this. 21, 22, 23, we're going to ask uh, Ate Linda to pray for this. 24, 25, 26, we're going to ask, um, sorry? Okay, uh, yeah, uh, let's remove 28. 24, 25, 26, we're going to ask Ate uh, Net to pray for that. And then, uh, for 27 and 29, I'll ask Queen Noel to pray for that. Okay, so um, does anyone have any other prayer concerns that they want to add? Um, yes, Queen uh, I just want to add about my field of work schedule that's staying right now because the work schedule plus the salary. Okay, so. Um, that it would be um, sufficient for them. Okay, uh, Pray Noel will add that to his uh, prayer, prayer concerns. Okay, anyone else would have uh, prayer concerns that they want to share? Uh, yes, please, Bert. Uh, yes, Ora Salenga. Okay, okay. Ora Salenga. Uh, yes, that's, uh, we also did that to pray the All right, anyone else? Okay, so if you, if uh, that is all that we have, and prayer concerns, let's uh, commit this time to prayer and we'll invite those who are assigned to come here in front and lead us all to prayer. Father, we humbly come before you, before your throne, Lord. We thank you for this worship service and thank you for your word.